and the whole crowd at Traders Expo. Wow. Holy cow, what a, what a crowd. There must be some market volatility out there. Wow, that's great. So, all right, let's go, let's go. Definitely the biggest speech presentation that I've ever given. Uh, we are in the presence of some big companies, so I'm gonna bring my, my A game here for you. So let's just kind of move in here real quick. Uh, we're gonna go like this. It works. Um, okay, as Kim mentioned, I'm a trader like you. Uh, so on this presentation, there's gonna be charts, there's gonna be live trades. If the details, because this is such a big room, are gonna be kind of small to see. So if you want, you can text that phone number right there and the slides will show up on your phone if you wanna follow along. Okay, so that's the number. Uh, hit it real quick because we're gonna keep the time schedule going. And besides that, let's have some fun. A lot of volatility. I'm really interested to learn as much about you guys as perhaps my approach and what I can share with you in the markets. This is a very, very busy time, a lot of uncertainties, and um, I hope you guys are ready to work. So no staying out late, up early, hit all the presentations. There's a lot of good content. It's, it's time for business. Okay, uh, real quick, I am the founder of tradinganalysis.com. Uh, real quick, just I'm a, uh, basically all I've ever done is in the trading markets, day one out of school. Uh, I was a professional trader. I've been to Wall Street, I've traded for a hedge fund, brokerage firm, now I trade my own capital and run my business, tradinganalysis.com. This is my team. One of those people up there is my mother. I'll let you figure out which one it is. But I've assembled a great team at Trading Analysis. And we focus on trading stocks, equities, uh, some futures, and some cryptos. So I'm a real trader. I manage my own money. I am in the trenches every day like you guys. I have winning trades. I have losing trades. I get kicked in the butt, just like all of you. But the whole idea, especially in volatile markets like this, is you got to get up, protect the risk, always keep moving, keep your hands up. Trading, especially now, is a boxing match. Okay, you cannot make it through this market unscathed. So risk management, which is the least favorite part that everyone wants to talk about, is what you need to focus on. How many people right now can say that you are here to learn the trading setup that's gonna make you money? I know, and I, it sounds so easy, but it's, I'm getting ahead of my slides. Let me just stay on track. I have so much to share with you, so let me just keep going. And I'll, I'll follow up on that question. Real quick, enough about me. Uh, I'm a CBC guy. I've done CBC probably 500 times. Honestly, it's about full disclosure. I am more uneasy now in front of this room than I have of any of the other 500 times I've been on CBC. So thank you for being here. Um, I was an X ski racer, a Division One ski racer in college. That kind of mindset is carried through into trading. Uh, it's all I've ever done as a career is trading. So I'm here to share with you what I've assembled over the years. As Kim mentioned, I just had a baby girl, Eden Rose, uh, last week. Uh, we have five-year-old boys, Jake and Brody. Uh, I trade at home, CNBC, and I'm also invested in another bull market, which is craft spirits. Distilling, American distilling is, uh, is booming right now. So try, maybe that's commodity for next year. <laughs> All that being said, and I'm gonna skip through this because again, we're, we're working low on time here, but all this impressive setup for me to speak, and I work in a basement. I live in a basement right now. I, I, it's not even my house. My wife, we've just moved. Uh, we bought a house where I'm from in upstate New York in Saratoga Springs. Oh, I just blew it. Don't listen to that. We're staying with my wife's parents in Jersey because she wanted to stay with her doctor. So I've been living like Wayne's World and doing my broadcast out of my basement, and soon I'll be joining the rest of the public here. Um, I do a YouTube stream every Wednesday morning if you want to hop on. Don't think it's going to happen. Just check YouTube, Todd Gordon, just like this. We get in, look at live trades, et cetera, et cetera. Eden, that's my baby girl. She's born 1118. And if you guys were just listening, in honor of Veterans Day, here's a trivia question for you. Okay? We're moving, leaving New Jersey to this place that I mentioned, and I blew my speech, what was the turning point of the Revolutionary War? Battle of Saratoga. Did you know it, or did you hear me say it? Shoot. 
I'm terrible at this. All right, so <laughs> let's, what a dork. Um, we're going to be talking about live trades. I'm a trader. As I said, I make winning trades. I make losing trades. I'm not somebody who tells you that get rich quick, just learn this setup, and you're going to make millions of dollars. Trading's a boxing match. So I'm going to show you some winning trades in here, but mark my words, I take losing trades, and that's part of it. As a professional trader, it's how well you take those losing trades. So here's what we're going to cover today. Um, mindset, I already mentioned it. It's nice to learn some setups, but it's the mindset that will let you kind of survive and thrive as a trader. We're going to talk about some of the technical tools I use to analyze the market to get context. That's the most important thing is context. I had the pleasure of sitting right next to Ralph and say, what do you think about this market? Where are we? Are we in a tr new downtrend? Are we in a corrective environment? And the context is everything because that's going to determine how you trade. And I can't believe, let me see those hands again. Options traders, how many are trading options? Holy cow. All right, now leave the hands up. How many are doing something besides just buying premium, buying puts, buying calls, doing multiple leg strategies? OK. All right. It's about 61.8% of the room does options. We're going to be talking about that in one second. Uh, we're also going to be talking about some fundamentals. There's a lot of volatility, and I want to tell you from my point of view why we see the volatility that we do. We're going to look, look at some past stocks and option trades that I have on. Also going to show you setups that I'm looking to do go forward. If we have the time, I'll show you the strikes and specific trades I'm looking to do. Future outlook for the US stock and bond market. Uh, a couple more trades. Wow, I definitely bit off more than I could chew on this presentation. I always bring too many slides, but I never want you to feel cheated. OK. Faster. Are you being sarcastic? Sorry, but have you heard Mr. Ralph Acampora over there? <laughs> He'll keep you going. All right. Come on now. You can do it. It's going to go. I know it will. Can you guys advance me? Can you guys manually advance me? Thank you. OK, um, so this is important. I have a big responsibility, I think, specifically with you option traders. We've got Mr. Ralph Acampora coming up next, and then Tom Salisnoff later. Do you guys see how fundamentally, from a trading point of view, different those two speakers who have much more experience than I do are? Has anybody thought about that? And I was wondering how they were going to square that up. And I think that's why Kim tapped me here, because I think the best, from my point of view, the best approach is a hybrid. He is the godfather of technical analysis. Tom Sawzoff, arguably, I don't know if we've anointed him as the, as the godfather of options, but he doesn't look at technical charts. He's looking at high implied volatility, looking to get into kind of a mean reversion, selling expensive premium. So how do you square that up? I think I'm the guy to kind of pull those two together. And that's how I approach the markets. OK? So just skipped ahead, Ralph. The, the godfather, Sawzoff, chart agnostic, will focus on selling high implied volatility. I combine these two styles, OK? Oh, come on. You can do it. All right. Context is key here. You got to know, are you in a trending market or are you in a corrective market? And as an option trader, that's key. I don't know. I mean, I understand it. High implied volatility, mean reverts. You sell options. You come back. You take in the premium. But if you're in a trending market, even worse, a downtrending market, that VIX, that volatility is going to perpetually stay high. So you have to have context through some kind of technical analysis, some kind of chart analysis to know whether we are in a violent 200, 300 point S&P range or if, in fact, we're in a new downtrend. And if you're trading options the wrong way and not have the context, you're going to have a rough time. So for me, I don't have the time right now to go into it. I gain my context with Elliott Wave. Elliott Wave is a wonderful way to identify what kind of pattern, what kind of phase of the current trend of correction you're in. Not something I can teach you right now in 20 minutes. Give it a couple months of good study, like any good skill, and it will become part of you. Corrections need to be studied. A correction just isn't sideways, slop and chop, back and forth. You can actually look for different legs and different patterns. And the traditional technical analysis patterns that you've studied can be better understood with Elliott Wave. OK? 
Okay? So I'm not going to go into it very much, but if it's something that you're interested in, I want you to go home and start to look into it a bit. LE Wave also will help you understand how a directional market unfolds. What does it look like as a market is moving from the bottom left hand side of the chart to the top right hand in a bull trend and vice versa for a downtrend? Context is key. How do you know? Are you always an options premium seller or is there times to be buying options? Should you just be buying straight options, doing spreads, doing butterflies? Uh, there's a lot of questions that I think can be answered by what the underlying market is doing. As I said, the classic patterns of technical analysis, from my point of view, can be understood with Elliott Wave. They're just based on the basic patterns of technical analysis. Wouldn't it be nice to know if we're in a massive triangle in the S&P, at what point this back and forth action in the S&P could end? And I'll kind of give you a sneak peek. I think it's going to be around March 1st. End of February, middle of March, from my point of view, that's the way I'm trading this market is we're going to continue to go sideways based on that traditional fourth wave triangle, which is in the top left-hand corner of the slide you're looking at. It's context. If I'm wrong, fine. I'm going to control the risk, get out, minimize any damage, and right the ship. If I'm right, I've traded my plan after I've planned my trade, which is the motto of my company. OK, that's all I'm going to talk about Elliott Wave. It's a lot to bite, but like a lot to bite off, but I just want you to be interested and go take it home and study. Now, let's get much simpler and talk about the 200-day moving average. I am not a huge moving average person until the last two years, year and a half. The 200-day has been incredibly important. How many guys have you noticed? The 200 days has been defining this market, in my point of view. And I'm just talking about the 200-day SMA, simple moving average. So let's take a look at what the 200-day has done and how the break of this 200-day, what does that mean for the market? Is it a possible reason that we're seeing so much volatility? So 2016, 2017 compared to today. I did this last week on CNBC or the two weeks ago. I brought this point up on Fast Money. Um, I don't know if any of you guys saw it, but they wanted me to come in and talk about the, the, the 200-day. And I don't like looking at a moving average and saying, if it breaks from above, be short. Or if it breaks from below, be long. I don't look at it that way. And I'll show you why. 2016. Fairly nice, the bull trend, uh, the most recent wave of the bull trend began. We've been above the 200 day, a little bit of volatility in 2016. 2017 didn't see a single test of the 200 day moving average. Every investor who was just sitting around doing nothing, making money, I'm pretty sure this room wasn't as big as it was last year, was it? No. Low volatility like this, everyone's a genius in a bull market. Then 2018 comes in. We have one, two, three tests, fourth test of 2018, and we're seeing a lot of volatility. And I did a study, and I was like, wait a minute. What does that mean? And I, you guys can't see this because it's black charts, but this is the exact same chart that I sent to producers of Fast Money. And I said, guys, there's been four major tests of the 200-day moving average since the credit crisis low. The first one in the bottom left, that's 2010. That one, I, from memory, is 92 days. Once you attack the 200-day, it was 92 trading days of back and forth. We retested again in 2011. I believe that was the European credit crisis. We went 100 and I can't even see, 105, 106 days of back and forth, no trend against the 200-day. Then we broke into a beautiful uptrend. Finally, after a nice rally for 2013, 14, 15, we got into 2016, attacked the 200-day again, 144 days. So in 92, 100, 144 days. So what's the takeaway on that? What is the takeaway? Oh, I did this nice. I forgot I did this nice inset for you. So 2010, 92 days. Check out this animation. 2011, 100 days. 2016, 144 days. So what does that mean now? OK. What does that mean now? I say we attacked the moving average, Kim, on October 11th. And since then, all hell has broken loose. 
So we've got four prior examples of an attack on the 200 day that's resulted in 92, 100, 144 days of back and forth. A conservative projection of 100 days gives you March 1st of more of this insanity. Is it guaranteed to be right? Absolutely not. But as a trader, an investor, I think you have to go into every trade with a plan and every series of trades with a plan. And when you have a plan and it doesn't work, you minimize your risk, you cut the trade, and you move on. A poorly laid plan is much better than no plan at all. Because when you have no plan, you put a, stop, a bad trade on, you're pissed off, you get mad, you revenge trade, you start doing stupid things. I think you gotta plan your trades in, the, in advance. And if they don't work, step back and say, no problem, today's not my day. I'm gonna live to fight another day. So let's talk about the fundamentals. From a fundamental point of view, why are we seeing the loss, potential loss of a 10-year uptrend? Asia. Asia has been underperforming for a long period of time. Take a look at the S&P in green on top of the Hang Seng. Okay? Hong Kong industrials. Massive, massive uh, divergence. You've got 2006 pre-credit crisis. The S&P is through those highs. Hang Seng can't get above those highs. Now granted, the 1970s, 80s, and 90s saw massive outperformance of China relative to the US. Is that starting to catch up? I don't know. Is the S&P catching up? I don't know. The way this is starting to play, you might say that S&P is starting to catch up to emerging and other developed um, Asian markets and emerging markets. Uh, EEM, okay, this is the ETF that most of us watch for emerging markets. I think it's 50% Asian stocks. It's basically the same thing as um, the Chinese ETF, which is FXI. Again, a massive, massive divergence. And if that divergence is gonna be unwound, this volatility that we are, we've seen is a long way from being over. And I hope we're not going to unwind that divergence because the only way you unwind that divergence is either those green and white lines go up to catch up to green or green goes down. All world ETF XUS, okay? All world in white against the S&P, not as bad of a divergence as Asia, but still pretty clear as the S&P is just crushed to new highs. That VEU has barely made it through a triple top from the 2011 high. So let's shift over to bonds. They say the Fed is starting to tighten. The Fed balance sheet is starting to come off. This was taken about two months ago. The Fed took all kinds of cheaply created credit and your taxpayer dollars. They funded their thinkorswim trading account and they bought a bunch of bonds to suppress interest rates, to force people into the markets. And that's the result of them going on the, buying, the bond buying street, quantitative easing. Well, they've started to let these treasuries roll off. That's all they've rolled off. It hasn't even done a 3% retracement or 5% retracement from their long bond position. Remember, when the Fed comes in and either they've let those bonds roll off or they're selling, that's gonna put upward pressure on interest rates. Remember, bonds up forces interest rates down, and that's what the Fed was doing, forcing interest rates down to get some inflation, spur economic activity, and force all of us into the stock market to get returns. Now, the Fed is done buying bonds. I think, and I've been on TV saying this multiple times, I think this is the most important chart that any of us can look at right here. This is a chart of the 30-year bonds on a log scale since the 1982 low. It's 38 years, 37 years of uptrends in bonds. And if you look closely, that lower trend line, which is very cleanly drawn, has broken. You're talking a four decade break in trend of bonds. That's as, I'm gonna be 40 in three months. That's, that's my life of 38, 30 year bonds right there. So is, if a four decade trend is gonna, is gonna break, what's the reason for that? I don't know outside of the scope of this, but that's another reason that I think we have some serious volatility ahead. From an Elliott Wave point of view, where I've highlighted there a test of about 115 in bonds, should be no problem if this trend break is for real. This is a big reason we're seeing the volatility. Okay, if you go out and you go to your restaurant or you go out with your friends or you're at the table playing cards tonight, play this trick on somebody. 
Kim, can I put you on the spot? What's the traditional relationship between stocks and the 30-year bond? What do, you th what, would, what do you think and what do you think people would say? What do you guys think? Inverse. Stocks up, bonds down? Huh? Yields down, stocks up. Who said that? So you think stocks and bonds go together. You're in the minority. OK. So if you want to sound smart at the poker table tonight, just get this slide and show them. In blue is the 30-year bond. In red is the S&P 500. Those charts look pretty close to me. I'd say stocks and bonds trade together. Stocks and interest rates trade inversely. Interest rates have been in decline for, as I said, 38 years. And that trend is starting to end. Okay, That trend is starting to end. We're starting to get a move up in rates and a move down in bonds. Goldman Sachs just put out an interesting research piece that said, for the first time in a long time, stocks and bonds are showing positive correlation because we've been inverse for a long period of time. So if bonds, in fact, are going down, Stocks are going down because interest rates are going up. Why are interest rates going up? Inflation creeping up. Is it credit quality problems? Are foreign holders of our debt saying, I don't like what's going on with your national deficit and your debt? I don't, maybe it's credit quality beyond my pay grade. But that's starting to scare me in terms of volatility. Um, OK. Just taking a big step back here, a couple little trading setups based on our new knowledge of what's happening in rates. It could be a false break. Bonds might not be breaking a four-decade uptrend. They might try to break down below the trend line and then snap back above. Don't you hate when that happens? So what we're looking at here is red and white is the XHB. That's your housing stock. Housing's gotten hammered lately with this move up in yields. A 30-year mortgage is what now, 5%? You might say, oh, I remember back in the 1970s when it was 14%. But if you figure, they just came from 2.75, and now they're 5%. It's relative. That's a 60%, 70% increase in mortgage costs. So where it was set in the 1970s, that has no idea. Because new home buyers who wanted to pay three, now they're going to pay five. Ugh, I don't know. So if oh, we got we to move. All right. So XHB, you can write this down, a little bit of Fibonacci. If, if yields do not absolutely spike up and crush housing. I think housing's at a good value area. We're talking 34 to 31.05. 33, 33 to 31. That's the must hold in XHB. If you start getting the housing breaking down through there, you're, you're going to see interest rates continue to push up, bonds down. This has been another source of volatility. I'm going to skip that one. Uh, Gold-silver relationship, that's kind of an old school. I'm going to skip that one just in the interest of time. Um, kind of a, uh, we got five, so I'm going, to go, I'm going to skip through this. Guys, if you want the specifics of how I trade options, probably not the, the venue. This is something I would do in a more intimate setting, kind of work you through the options. If you want this, go ahead, text this, grab these trades. I'll show you exactly some past select trades of what we did. Um, with the Russell. I personally, from an options trading point of view, from a technical point of view with Elliott Wave, getting context, I love spreads. And I love buying a debit spread, but then layering a credit spread right on top with the same center strike. Have a context. Know where the market should move up to. What's buying a debit spread in calls and then selling a credit spread right on top of that? Anybody know? Butterfly. Love trading butterflies. You're paying for a debit spread up to where you think the market's going to go, based on Elliott and Fibonacci. And if you have a target, why not do a credit spread above, taking some premium? I trade basically a 180-minute chart, depending on volatility, 240. And I have a range. I have context. I know where I'm going. I'm going to put the spreads on, but I'm going to reduce the cost and also improve my theta with, the, with these butterflies. So again. Kind of an incomplete presentation, just trying to be respectful of time. I mean, how do you run over on The Godfather? That's not very advisable. <laughs> so go ahead and grab these. But um, more information uh, available on the butterflies and kind of the way we actually trade this market. 
This one is just kind of saying, hey, look how cool we are. We bought the break in the Russell, did the butterfly, and then all of a sudden, September 26th, the Fed comes out and they start really hammering the market. And we said, enough, no more. We've been long for a long time and we're done. I get crazy with the video. I like doing this kind of stuff and putting the cameras and making a studio. And like I said, I've got the Wayne's World party on Wayne uh, basement setup studio going. So be sure to check out that kind of stuff. I be, I'm very transparent with the trades. I trade live, execute live all the time. I'm trading my real money, et cetera, et cetera. Um, NASDAQ into the top. I was thinking we'd get 70, 77.50 or so. We did layer in some shorts on the NASDAQ. I took profits way too soon on that. But hey, it was according to the plan. Got into Na NASDAQ um, with Melissa Lee. This was power lunch, uh, looking for the trend line break. I told Melissa right on the break of the NASDAQ that we should get down to 7,000. That was a 50% retracement over the last 18 months. I thought that was conservative. And Melissa goes, wow, Todd, really, that far down? I think we went down to 66 or 67 in the NDX. And so far, we've held. We might have made a new lows after today's bloodbath. So just kind of examples of live trades, again, at your disposal if you would like. So how to handle 2018, the balance of, and 2019. From an Elliott Wave, this voodoo that I do point of view, I don't think this is going to be the top. I'm not there yet. I'm not short. I've been nibbling at longs. I've been wrong so far. From my point of view, and I was just talking to Ralph about this, 2,500 happens to be a very key technical support in the SPX. If you break that, that's channel, FIB, and Elliott Wave support, that's a problem. 2,500 gets you 2,200. But if I can get a look at 2,500, I think it is uh, worthy of a buy. That means that with the S&P, I captured this on the plane, believe it or not, but it was much lower by the time I landed. Um, I do think we do have 2,800 resistance S&P could be a decent setup down towards that 2,500, 2,550, 2,500. If you break there, that's a problem. If you're nimble and you want to define your risk and you want to try to get down there, go ahead, but know how to handle the volatility here. And if we get through 2,500, that's a problem. Watch interest rates. Watch housing. Watch your sectors. There's a lot of things you got to take in here. OK. Um, I didn't want to make this all dire and scary, but that's the kind of market we're in. So let's talk about happy stuff. Let's talk about some longs. Netflix, love it. Above 260. Where did it close today? Anybody know? Time's up. Where did it close? Ah, oh, you guys are. What? 294. Okay, we're above 280. Netflix still viable. Tesla, come on, I had to get this one in. Sorry, Kim. <laughs> um, I was on for CNBC for earnings, and, and I actually went short Tesla through the support, which was a terrible idea. I got, I got stopped out on long side, got skewered on Twitter. But as much grief as Elon has taken, the lows right there, the recent decline held. It was a beautiful support. Looking at a little bit of Fibonacci, as crazy of a stock as Tesla is, 2016, 34% decline. 2000, the recent 2018 decline, 37%. The most recent, where Elon got, went in, into a battle with SEC, 36% decline. A lot of symmetry, a lot of rhythm, a lot of structure in Tesla. As much bad news has been thrown at this stock, if the overall market stabilizes up through 380, I think Elon's 420 is no problem. Oh, small caps. I'm going to kind of skip over that. If we continue to see a strengthening dollar environment, small caps will outperform. Domestic stocks will do better in a strengthening dollar environment. Bitcoin through 5,000, no problem. Guys, that's it. That was fast. Was that fast enough? All right. Guys, thank you very much. I'm from tradinganalysis.com. Check us out. And uh, I'm going to have Kim call my wife. Thank you very much. <laughs>